Hello. Here we are. We're home. <laughs> yes, we are. And we're talking about home. Uh, Mr. David Fowley of Keeping It Real. You got to get all those plugs in uh, early or else I'm just going to totally forget. Uh, yeah, this is, we're going to talk about, I think, one of my favorite films of the year. Uh, I don't, I, I know you liked it. I don't know if, if uh, you liked it as much as I did. I don't know if anybody liked this movie as much as I did. Um, but uh, yeah, it's one of those odd films that's coming out. It'll, by the time this goes up, it'll be out in, I'm guessing, select theaters and on demand, right? Uh, I hope so. And I think people should definitely seek it out. But um, set this up for us. What is Home and why should people see it? Well, it's an independent feature. And uh, the curious thing about it is it's the directorial debut of Franca Potenta. Uh, most people know her from Run, Lola, Run, the Born Supremacy, and many other movies. But uh, she had directed a short um, a while back. But um, now this is her feature-length debut. And she's got uh, an incredible amount of uh, great actors with her um, on this journey. It is somewhat of a straightforward, simple story, but again, it's told really well. It's basically, if you want to just sum it up, it's, uh, you know, um, an, ex, an ex-convict who gets released out of, uh, you know, he's in his late 30s, gets released out of uh, a prison. He's been incarcerated for the last 17 years, and he comes back to a small town. We, we could say it's probably Southern California. A small town and um, not a lot of people really want him back there because of what he'd done and what landed what he what he's done and what's landed him in jail all these years and he comes home to uh, a house uh, where his mom lives um, where we assume he grew up and uh, his mom is very ill find out she you know she is you know quite ill and he needs to take care of her uh, his mother's played by Kathy Bates uh, the main character is uh, Marvin um, and he's played really well also by Jake McLaughlin and um, we also have uh, in the film uh, Ashling Franciosi uh, who plays a character named Delta who's um, you know aware her family is very much aware of uh, what Marvin had has done in the past and although she isn't she is more so removed because she's probably, you know, she was really young when that happened. Uh, so she grew up knowing the impact uh, that his uh, crime had on their family, but she didn't really know too much about it. Uh, we also have uh, uh, Lil Ray Howery, who plays um, Kathy Bates, uh, Bernadette's characters, plays his uh, her nurse who's taking care of her. And uh, of course, Stephen Root rounds it out as uh, the local priest in the small town. And uh, yes, these are all, you know, kind of uh, most of them are all um, uh, recognizable, but they're, they're also, you were reminded that these are great character actors playing very interesting characters. And uh, the movie kind of surrounds itself around certain themes like grief, loss, uh, regret, and uh, a poignant look at forgiveness and the lack thereof. Yeah. Um, there's a lot crammed into this movie. Yeah. And I'm using that word again. Just for folks who are just watching this, um, David and I both had a chance to participate in separate uh, press roundtables with uh, with Franca Patenta and Kathy Bates and Ashling Franciosi. Um, and I sort of made the mistake of using that word crammed as far as like talking about all the themes that she worked into the movie and the screenplay. And um, I think Franca thought it was uh, almost a negative connotation. So I, I quickly clarified. But this is, you know, I don't know how this is her feature you know, writing and directorial debut because the skill with which she puts a lot of these ideas and themes and nuanced versions of these conversations, you know, in material that isn't based on a novel, because this feels like it was something that I could go out and, and pick out a paperback and read more about these, these characters. It's very, you know, richly uh, realized. 
it's just amazing to me. Mm -hmm. um, beginning with, uh, you know, at first I thought this was going to be slow cinema or something because it, for a <laughs> long time we're watching uh, Marvin get into town. He's on this like long kind of country road riding a skateboard, stops at a gas station, um, hits up a, the attendant for a smoke, turns down a shag, uh, gradually makes his way back into town. So this movie, it's not quite a slow burn, but uh, we we don't get handed anything in here mm -hmm. we, everything is revealed except for the specifics of the actual crime that got him sent up the river i mean we know that he went away for uh murder but we don't know why it happened you know we get glimpses of the scene because the uh, you know the brother of ashling's character uh talks about I guess being there in some capacity or, or seeing the, mm -hmm. the immediate aftermath, but you're like, really, what happened here? So it's kind of a mystery. I and there, there's no like flashbacks. You know, I was kind of waiting. You know, pretty early on, I realized this wasn't going to be the kind of movie that would do what I'm about to describe. But I've seen other movies that have, where yeah. at, there's a big mystery, and at the very end of the movie, you see the flashback of the event that happened, so you can get you know put everything into context. But you really have to make up your own mind about what you think happened and also how you feel about it. I kind of love that about the way the narrative is in this film. Um, and it is impressive that, you know, this material could have been a novel, you know, um, easily before, you know, um, a feature feature length film. Um, but I, I really, as the story unfolded, I, I really liked the way that Patenta uh, trusts the audience, trusts the viewer to um, arrive at their own conclusions. And, um, you know, if some of you don't know, you know, in a round table situation, you're, it's pretty much you and maybe two or three other critics who are interviewing one or two or three people in this case. And so you got to be kind of selective with the questions you have. But I kept on thinking if I had a one on one with, you know, Franca, I would I would, you know, commend her on, you know, just not going the flashback route and not showing like young Marvin or whatever, uh, not showing the actual act. And I think that um, in a way it enriches the story a whole lot more and the characters when, you know, there's a scene where. Uh, Marvin and Delta go back to the scene of where that act occurred. And that's enough, you know, because of what the characters are conveying and uh, how that whole tone is done. Um, you know, that, that is enough right there. You can imagine that something cruel happened. I didn't even know what really happened, um, you know, to the, to the family member of, of Delta um, until the round table and Kathy Bates kind of, you know, basically, you know, kind of unloaded on what actually happened. And, and I was like, Oh, wow. Well, now I'm going to have to go back and, and I'll have to watch that or, or read yeah. it when it gets posted. Yeah. Cause yeah. they, they didn't give, uh, cause we kind of talked around it because we don't want to spoil mm -hmm. a whole lot for people, but, uh, they didn't really talk about whether or not there was a fully fleshed out, uh, story for what happened. And I don't think anything was ever shot, but this is like, you know, how either they built up a backstory and just was, it was never in the script, but there were details there and discussed that, you know, Kathy Bates alluded to um, that was like, oh, wow, I'm glad that wasn't in the movie, mm. um, you know, and I, I could see how it could have been in any other movie, but I'm, I'm just glad that you know, uh, Paten Patenta has the forbearance just to say, you know, no, this is enough. And because it is such a character driven, uh, character focused uh, story, it's, um, you know, sufficient to just be there in, in the moment with these characters. And um, I also appreciated the fact that this movie could have easily there could have been moments of more, say, like abrupt violence. There could have been moments of kind of egregious stereotypes of, you know, say, you know, lower income white people, whatever. Um, uh, I'm glad that's not in there, really. And uh, I, I feel like these characters are treated like, 
you know, real authentic people. Yeah. I mean, it's one of the things that, that struck me is this is a portrait of masculinity that we don't really see a whole lot of um, in, you know, particularly modern movies. Uh, you know, especially the idea of like the guy who gets out of prison and has to go back home. I mean, we've kind of seen that story before, sure. but you don't get the sense that it's unclear what Marvin's experience was in prison. I mean, I'm sure it wasn't pleasant. He's got, you know, he's all tatted up and everything. You don't know if he got that, if that was, he had that when he was 20 before he went up the river or if those are some of those are prison tats or, or what, but he's a very quiet, you know, kind of guy, there isn't, you know, he's very vulnerable throughout the whole thing. And other movies, I think would have had the big like confrontation where he, you know, gets in a fight or he kills again and then gets hauled off. And it's like a big tragedy cycle of violence type of a thing. But you really get to see the full, the full version uh, of a person whose entire life was like, just kind of snapped away. Uh, and you get to see the aftermath of that in the other characters when he's talking to uh, his mom, who's in a really bad way. Uh, you know, I guess the, the father had died, you know, some years earlier. And she's like, I've been rattling around this house for, you know, 17 years without your help. So don't, you know, go babying me. Um, yeah. But we get all these different kind of spectra of, you know, men. I'm not 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 necessarily necessarily saying that there's some kind of a big thesis about you know what's going on with with dudes, but it seemed like a pretty fair representation of you've got the the kind of the alpha male you know jerk violent guy who just wants to go punch things because his life didn't turn out the way he thought, and he's he's completely hung up on this thing that happened 20 years ago. Don't his would, brother, yeah, that uh, yeah, uh, Russell played by mm -hmm. James Jordan, mm -hmm. um, to very well, I think, and I think it's also a strength of uh, on the part of the screenplay there is a one minute scene that kind of humanizes russell it's when we see him babysitting uh his nephew his nephew yeah delta's yeah. son um and it's not just like oh he's baby you know watching the kid he's actually like interacting and reading a story and like oh my god this is wow this is an actual person because every other scene we see him in he's like practically drooling or literally pissing on someone and um, i love that he answers the door and marvin's there and he's holding his nephew and then he's like, closes the door, comes back, no longer holding nephew, and has to deal with Marvin. He's like, wait a minute. <laughs> yeah, and I think didn't he didn't he have didn't he have his glasses on or something when he opened the door so, or something? Yeah. Right, because he was reading. <laughs> yeah, but there's then, all those great little touches. Yeah, and then you've got um, Wade, who is the um, played by Derek Richardson, who's mm -hmm. the child childhood friend of uh, Marvin. Marvin. Yeah who's you know he lives in an a busted up rv on the side of the road and he's like buying pills from uh from delta because that's partially how she makes her money is she works at a hospital and she steals stuff from the supply cabinet but <laughs> that's a character we've seen a hundred times before where by the end of the movie you're thinking oh he's gonna od or he's gonna knock over a liquor store to get money and marvin's gonna get implicated and go back to jail i mean literally all of the the cliches of every movie that's kind of like this there's the seeds in the film and it just goes off on like what if we didn't go the easy route like every mm -hmm. decision it goes the smart way yeah i think partly it's because of the way you know derek's playing the character but also you know like you said the way it's written is like they there's this movie gives time to these characters and allows them to be human and real. Um, and there's no real cliches to any of them. Um, and, you know, it kind of reminded me of like, as I was watching this, I'm like, wow, this kind of reminds me of like, a, maybe like an early nineties Gus Van Zandt movie, like my own private Idaho or something like that, you know, um, where these characters would be taking, uh, be taken seriously and, and not, you know, you know, trapped by stereotypes or cliches. And I was surprised by that and really appreciated it. Um, I, I don't know about you. I mean, I, maybe I'm backing up a little bit here, but I never even heard about this movie until we got the email. Yeah. Uh, and, and so I'm like, wait, directed by Frank. Oh yeah. I definitely want to check that. And Kathy B and Ash. Wow. I definitely want to see this. So I was pleasantly surprised. There's not even a trailer for this yet. Is that true? I don't, I haven't seen one and wow. I, you know, I looked at IMDb and YouTube and I don't see a trailer for it. So I'm, you know, I'm glad it's coming out, you know, but I, I'm just wondering about the, 
you know, the, the marketing for it, I, I don't want it to be lost in the mix. Uh, uh, the good thing about streaming nowadays is, you know, every, every movie, no matter the size has a chance, you know? <laughs> and so, you know, well, that's the other thing is like, we're knee deep in award season, you know, mm -hmm. we're officially in the, you know, every third email is like a UPS notification, <laughs> you know, sure. um, but uh, this is something that it's coming out during award season, but there's no, buzz there's no attention as you mentioned there's no trailer uh, but there's a lot in here i think performances that people should uh consider and i just wonder if because i mean it's got stars in it but mm -hmm. you know you know kathy bates i think she's an oscar winner and uh, ashling french yossi is tremendous but then again the nightingale the film that kind of put her on the map is also a film that nobody wanted to see and few people did because it's so intense right. and franca patenta i mean not to take anything away from her but the born movies were like you know 15 20 years ago and run the little run so that's the thing i feel like this is the kind of movie that it's not a comic book movie and it doesn't have like these big flashy contemporary it doesn't have benedict cumberbatch in it i think if he showed <laughs> up as as wade everyone would be losing their minds over the entire production but right. this is definitely right. something that needs a spotlight yeah i mean i it's funny because i i watched this after watching um sean baker's latest red rocket at um chicago critics film festival and that's coming out in this month later as well and that is also about a character who's been gone for a while returning back to his small town dealing with a lot of like low-income white people and so it's it's kind of like where have I oh yeah okay uh, but this is this is totally different you know it's it's again taking uh, themes and people a lot more seriously you know there is some humor uh, in this movie but I would consider it more as levity um, yeah. you know like um, when we do see Marvin and Wade like reuniting with each other and hanging out I like what I like about this movie is that uh, one of the things I like about it is that it treats the absence of time that Marvin experienced. Um, it, it it deals with it, and it and it also shows how other characters have been affected by it. So when he is reunited with Wade, you get the idea that like these guys really <laughs> don't have much to say to each other because there's this seventeen year absence, and it's like what have you been doing with your life? And, you know, at one point Wade says, what, for the last 20 years, you know, and, <laughs> you know, and um, it's, that's true. You know, it's like, it reminded me of like what it's like when you go to like a high school reunion, it's mm -hmm. like, so how have you been? It's like, wait, what? I mean, I haven't seen you since graduation. You know, where, where do you want me to start? And that's the awkward thing is that uh, when I say that, you know, the movie deals with the, absence um and and the absence of a character and being out of place and time being incarcerated you know there's there's a point in the also in the movie where um Lil Ray's character asks Marvin to answer his phone and he doesn't know how to answer it he picks it up and he's just like ah, you know it's going off and he doesn't know to press green to answer the phone and he's like well it stopped and there's this whole situation where you're know, seen where he's walking outside with delta and she's like so you haven't even seen walking dead you haven't seen game of thrones and so that, know, that I, was a little bit on the nose though. i know right <laughs> i was and that, that's another thing where i would have said so when you read that line of game of thrones what did you think um but you know i i like that because again we're spending time with these characters and we're also you know addressing the absence of time and, and what happens when you come back and everybody has moved on and everybody has things in their life has experienced things in their lives that you haven't well it's interesting and i'm i feel terrible because i'm blanking on the name of the movie but there was an independent film i watched and reviewed a couple years ago that was about uh a guy a kid he, he, i think he was in his 20s and he had gone up the river for like five years or something like that like out of college for a drug bust and like he had covered up for a number of his friends so he gets out and he gets taken to this dinner party and like everybody's there but the whole point of it is 
kind of like what you're saying, catching up on what's been going on in everybody's life. And he kind of stands up and, and berates everybody for complaining about, you know, all their kind of little trivial things like, oh, my job sucks. He's like, then go get another job. You know, you're not sitting in a, in a five by 10 cell, yeah. <laughs> you know, that kind of a deal. But you look at what's going on with home and it's sort of the same thing. While Marvin has been locked up and either going through hell or boredom or just the boredom of hell uh, or hellish boredom, I guess. Everybody else outside, you look at their lives. What are they doing? Uh, Russell is living with his sister and he's got like these hangers on who are half his age, just like sitting around probably doing dope. Yeah, they're they're Mm. cousins, but they're all like, we're led to believe like drinking or doing dope and like getting stoned and playing video games all day. Occasionally babysitting, you know, the sister's kid and she's like peddling pills to like make ends meet. Uh, You look at Wade and his life is completely down the toilet. Not any of this is necessarily to do with the incident. They don't go and try and tie it up. Like everyone right. is so affected that their lives went down the toilet. Mm-hmm. It's just that they haven't really done anything. And we don't get a sense from Marvin that he would have done anything spectacular with his life or that he, you know, admonishes anybody against, you know, compl- feeling sorry for themselves because what if he's gone through, but it just kind of makes, or it made me as a viewer think, you know, what this movie is trying to say about, the opportunity and the, the the big picture gift of every day that you right. have and what are you doing with your own potential right yeah and you know marvin he could have been introduced to us like a character who was resentful or had a chip on his shoulder or, or he could have been a jerk uh but you know you mentioned slow cinema in the beginning and it, it is he is a quiet character throughout mo- throughout most of the movie and he he is kind of you know, cautious, observant, but I think also there's a weight to him that has this, you know, kind of regret. And I'm wondering how different he was before, you know, he went to jail and I'm sure his incarceration uh, brought about this reflectiveness. I mean, you have a lot of time to think about what you did and a lot of time to think about where, what your life has become and where it's going to go and the people in your life that are no longer with you um so he he has changed and moved moved on but he's going back to a place where nobody else really has and he's going back to a place where it's it's kind of like you know when you when you go home and visit your family for thanksgiving or whatever that it's like they still treat you like the kid that you were (laughs) growing up and so it's like these these characters in this town uh, only really know him from for the crime that he's he committed you know and they don't know you know there's uh, I know it was discussed in this round table I think it was talked about in the movie but she had never his mother had never visited him in in prison that's and that's something yeah. that they never talk about but you pick up early on because you get the idea that nobody went to see him i mean certainly yeah. not wade because he was right. all strung out but yeah yeah the the mom just never went for whatever reason either she couldn't get there or she couldn't bring herself to to go visit him or whatever uh, but there was also never the tearful yelling like you never came to visit me i right. hate you you know you okay. never even got the sense that he felt that because maybe he's like look I understand that I've, you know, I've done a horrible thing. I've destroyed my family's reputation in this town. I'm just going to go away, do my time and maybe come back. And I wonder if some of that feeling that he has coming into town, that timidity and that reserve that you're picking up on is the idea that no matter how tough he had to be in prison, he's going back to a town that literally hates him and has people in it that will beat him to a pulp in the middle because there's a scene and there's a jump in an alley but it's yeah. not like a big city alley it's like a neighborhood alley it's where open alley during yeah, the day what well, this was this was during like kind of was dusk. It like, yeah the dusk yeah yeah but there were houses around so very easily someone could have walked out and said you know hey stop beating up on that kid and they would have been like no this is the guy that you know killed oh that never lady. mind keep yeah. doing it <laughs> right <laughs> <laughs> it's like it's like a uh, rock ridge from blazing saddles you know? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> oh my gosh but yeah so th- all, again all of this stuff that is not spelled out there's no hand holding it's just there for you to pick up on possibly during you know multiple viewings because i feel like there's enough here that i could go back and, and watch this again kind of like reading a great book and and pick up on themes that i didn't really realize yet one of the details i loved is that 
kind of contrary to what I just said, at one point, Marvin goes to a bar and he's hesitant to go in. But then um, Lil Rel, Howry, Jaden, the uh, his mother's the nurse, nurse yeah. spots him and says, oh, just, you know, come in here with me. And they cut to the inside of the bar and Marvin's sitting there looking around nervous. And Jaden's mm-hmm. like, oh, no one in here is over 21. They don't know who you are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and it's just it's like cover because it's the one place yeah it's just a bunch of kids who unless they were directly connected to the event they don't know they might have heard marvin's name before but they probably don't know what he looks like yeah i i really like i mean it yeah i really like the way even the it's a it's a side supporting character you know in in little ray plays but i really like the way he was written the way he's portrayed is like you know I'm sure that he knew about Marvin from what, you know, the town said and what his mother had said. But if you watch, if you watch the movie again, which I'm sure we will, um, there's those moments between that he has between him and Marvin, not just the part where he brings him into the bar, but he wants to include Marvin in Bernadette's life, his mother's life. And he knows it's hard for both of them, but he knows that it's what's needed. And, you know, as the movie unfolds, we learn that, well, you know, Bernadette's days are, you know, more numbered than we realized. And, you know, Marvin has to, you know, kind of like face the reality of like every day with his mom is a gift, you know, and and what what can I do with this time and what can I do for her? And and. You know, I, I so I really appreciated the way that this nurse character again, it could have been a stereotypical who knows, you know, whatever, <laughs> but uh, you know, I, I appreciated the fact that he was a, a fully developed, you know, person, even in this, you know, small amount of time that we hang with him. And and it's funny because, like, just about everybody from what I remember, just about everybody, it's it's that kind of small town where just about everybody gets around on like a an old bike, <laughs> and I think, I think there's like I think that's how uh, Jaden arrives at the house, like on a, on a bike and stuff. And I think it was on, or, he was on a, Oh, Jaden. Yeah. Okay. Jade, yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. Jade, yeah. Yeah. I mean, there was a skateboard of course and everything, but yeah, I mean, even um, uh, Delta is riding around on a bike, you know, and, and so there's just that there's those, those subtle world building that I really appreciated about this, you know, small town. It's like, you never see like crazy traffic or buses or anything like that. It's just, um that there's it reminds me of like you know when you go on a road trips and you know maybe you're stopping somewhere in the middle of nowhere and you're like wow people live here you know (laughs) and it's like it's you you forget that like yeah people live everywhere and um i'm i'm appreciative of the fact that you know this movie this story um really brings the people that we probably wouldn't really you know, think about once or twice uh, to the forefront. And um, I think there's a lot of, you know, beyond the themes, I think there's a lot of uh, relatable characters here um, that we, you know, maybe initially might either, you know, judge prematurely or write off. But I think the more time we spend with them, again, partly the way it's written, partly the way it's portrayed, we realize that oh well, there's there's a lot going on here, and these these characters are pretty rich. Indeed, I do want to ask you about. And I kind of alluded this before we talked, uh, you know, before we started the show. I think on Facebook or something. Um, there was one moment where, towards the end, where I was kind of nervous that they'd kind of jumped the shark. Uh, I still thought it was a good scene, but a little bit weird. And it takes place in a church. Now, hmm. I like the way that the scene resolved. I like the way it was played, but the uh-huh. setup was just kind of weird. Um, I don't want to get too spoilery for folks because I definitely want people to see it and make up their own minds about it. But there's a scene where Marvin and Bernadette go to church and there are some characters that we've seen before, you know, throughout the movie who also happen to be there and there's quite a stir. And I'll just say that like at one point Bibles are literally being thrown across the room. And I'm like, this is a little too far. I I think what's interesting to me is like, you say that there's characters there that were, 
already you know in the story and it's like it feels like the whole town was in there and, and it's like yeah that that's something that you might see like in a western you know um <laughs> Very much you know so, like yeah you know like uh, you know little house in a prairie type thing um <laughs> but i think that if it wasn't in a church it would have been like moose lodge town hall or something i think that the story was culminating to a moment like that and, you know, where, where the townspeople had to somewhat confront, not just, and I, I think it's good that it was in a church, but they, they had to confront Marvin, but also they had to confront their behavior. And, yeah. and so, you know, it is odd that, you know, Delta's siblings and cousins were in the church. It's like, they don't seem like church going people. It's and like, that's, why, and that's why are the they thing. there? Like, why are they there? If I had to, if I were to make one little tweak to this pretty perfect screenplay, they would be outside the church, you know, or they would have like been hanging out on the corner drinking at 10 o'clock on a Sunday and then right. just seen Marvin and uh, and Bernadette going into the church and like, hey, come on, let's you I know. can see that. Yeah, if even if that like was a that. quick scene before that, I could I can understand that. Yeah. Um, but you know, I, I think that it's and, and it's funny because the 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 priest that Stephen Root played is kind of weird. Like he almost needs his own side story. He seems like yes. this kind of like wily, weird, small town priest who, who barely wants to be in his, you know, uh, priest garb. You know, he's always in like shorts and a t-shirt, but um, he, he doesn't seem, he seems like a mess and kind of like not the most, you know, uh, not a great role model, let's say. Uh, but he is kind of, he makes a point you know, where he, he, I think he goes to like Matthew three or four, where he talks about forgiveness and, and he's on the nose and he's talking about forgiveness for, for a good reason. Cause he knows who's there. And I think he's glad everybody's there, but he also knows that this is going to be tough, you know, and, and he loses his audience because, you know, like you said, Bibles are thrown. Um, it, it's just the fact that Marvin and his mother are there and the whole town is there. So all these characters culminate in this one, spot and um i i like the fact that he's kind of a mess um and you know he's throwing expletives and stuff you know <laughs> uh, which is a little odd as a priest but it, it's it's still fitting for the whole environment and he's just like look um enough look look at all of you you know and um you know if, if you can't forgive and if you can't look at this person and forgive he's here you know um you can leave you know and and i i appreciated that and um he did say something that i didn't think like was really i i, I get what he was saying i think he's saying okay whoever's left here they're here for you i'm like well not all of, i think they're just there <laughs> like how's this train wreck gonna work out you know and they were afraid to leave you know and some people were still like giving them that you know townsperson look like mm, you know like um, if we if we are we getting kicked out of church and if we yeah. leave church does that mean we're going to hell <laughs> yeah yeah is there, is there still potluck after church um but but i i um i think that that if it was a little off you know for for you i think the the there is a need for marvin to at some point in the story to not necessarily confront, but just stand up and say, Hey, let me tell you why I'm here. Yeah. You know, and this was that moment. And I think it was well done and, you know, well earned. And I think, um, uh, McLaughlin did a great job. I, I, I don't think I've ever seen him in anything else or not a whole lot. I looked him up. He's done some, I think he's in a, a TV, TV series work. right now. He yeah. was in, he was in that, a movie I love warrior from 10 years ago. Oh yeah. I, yeah, yeah. I, I don't remember him in it. I got to go remember back and watch that, that. Um, in the Valley of Ela, Oliver Stone's savages. I, oh. I, I deliberately have blocked that movie out of my memory, but um, <laughs> no, he is, he is phenomenal in it. And even Steven Root, I, we've seen the kind of off, off kilter priest before, but what I love about his character is first of all, they established the church as you know, it's got this nice big white 
cross on it and it looks like a church but it also has like a little like suburban driveway attached to it when we first see him <laughs> or one of the early scenes he's like washing the church van or something and yeah, yeah, yeah. and he's got his frock on but he's also in his like his dirty orange boxer shorts or right, whatever right. it is um you get the and he talks to bernadette about like how he tried to talk to her and counsel her through all that grief and stuff you just get the feeling that he's a guy who's a true believer but he's been sort of stuck in this town trying to do good at a town that is completely broken and apathetic to anything he might have to offer. They yeah. show up to church, but it obviously isn't sinking in because they turn into animals. Like the yeah. second that someone says, Hey, it's okay to turn into an animal despite right. being in the house of God. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's, I can see, you could see how it's definitely wore him down. Um, and he, he's become this kind of, you know, I, I, you know, again, this movie could have gone the way of stereotypes and I'm just, I'm glad he never had like, you know, a flask or something, you know, <laughs> you, you could have been easily like an alcoholic priest or something, but he's got um, one. He just, they just didn't yeah, need yeah, to show it. Yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. But um, yeah, it definitely, there's little moments, a little nuances with the characters and uh, you know, no one does that better in this movie than Kathy Bates. Um, I think, um, you know, in, in the round table, I don't know what she said in yours, but she was saying how, you know, I'm so used to getting these big roles, you know, like, like not huge parts, but the roles are usually like big, you know, mm. and, you know, where, where I'm supposed to be like huge, you know, just a, you know, the, the, the biggest presence in the room, you know, and, and she was glad to get a role where a lot of times She's just kind of like muttering under her under her breath or even just, you know, working, portraying the character with just glances and, you know, kind of subtle responses because she's, yes, she's uh, physically ill, but she's also another, you know, worn down character mentally and emotionally. Um, the, it, it's mentioned subtly, but, you know, the, the, the person, um, that you know she was she was basically very close to the person who uh was killed long ago and um that was pretty much that character's you know best friend and it was you know hinted at um but you know that it's also her son who did that mm -hmm. you know and th there's a great moment early on where you know once marvin's back and she was just like saying i think to Jaden, she's like i don't recognize my boy you know, and, you know, um, there's a lot of grief and loss there. And um, I think, you know, Bates portrays it really well. Um, and uh, this could have been a character who was kind of, you know, could have been relegated to a wheelchair, relegated to like just bed scenes. Um, but, um, you know, one of the great uh, things about casting Bates is that she is, also known for playing just, you know, uh, stubborn, strong-willed, you know, reliant, you know, characters. And she's, she's good at playing those. And <laughs> there's a great, there's a, a moment, a couple of scenes with like a shotgun. And there's just a great <laughs> little scene on the front porch where it's just like, you know, a, a weary Bates in like kind of like a nightgown, day broad daylight and a shotgun on her lap in her front porch. It's like, what is this what is happening here you know <laughs> but again i've seen I, I can't name it but i've seen the movie and probably you know half a dozen movies where there's a character on a porch with a shotgun to protect someone and there's a confrontation mm -hmm. but there's no scene in this movie where kathy bates picks up the gun at the tweaker cousins and says you're not gonna get my boy you know yeah it, you don't it, it i guess goes a different way a way that is much more emotionally and you know narratively satisfying right the one thing that <laughs> it bothered me i thought about richard roper's tweets he's gotten into this thing roger ebert used to have like the 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 movie dictionary and like the, right. the ebert's laws and stuff right. in movies yeah roper's kind of taken on that mantle of like tweeting out these movie laws and there is one that occurred to me in this film. It's impossible to have a scene where a character is in a kitchen using a cutting board, cutting up vegetables, without usually cutting onions, themselves. without cutting themselves. <laughs> that happens in this movie. That's the one cliche. Where I'm like, come on. <laughs>
Uh, wasn't wasn't there also a scene, a quick scene in this? And again, the camera is very observant in this movie. And I could I've seen so many movies lately, award season, you know, where it, it all kind of blurring. But wasn't there also a scene when he comes back that he's looking around and he sees like a hole in the wall that was taped yes. up? Yeah. Okay. So when I thought about I thought about that quick shot from earlier in the film when he cut himself i'm like oh he's gonna lose it and again that didn't happen i mean yeah he swore and he's in pain and everything but i thought you know he's gonna punch through cabinet or something but just because that's from what we saw that was probably him in, in his past well possibly and, because yeah. one the the detail that i and i like the word you used observant um we see the hole, but surrounding the hole is these strips of flowery pattern tape. Just to kind of make it look better or something. Right. Now, it's either to make it look better or, you know, if you want to get like meta and kind of weird, like maybe it's to preserve them. <laughs> like it's it's almost like a, a fond memory. Like, oh, that's the last time they, they, he punched the wall right before the cops dragged them out. That was my last memory of him before he left. Yeah. But it's yeah. entirely possible that Marvin didn't even punch that hole. It could it have could been be, it could have been his brother. Could have been his brother it could have been, been bernadette the, the mom yeah, you know, yeah, the in, mom. in a moment of, of rage we haven't yeah. even talked about the fact that the grief in this family is compounded by the fact that marvin had a brother uh jake i think his name was who uh, killed himself in the intervening yeah. years and there's a there's a really odd scene it's not a tug at the heartstrings it's just more of the like you were saying the idea of lost times where Bernadette is sitting at the table talking to Marvin about all the people who've passed away, you know, in the, in the time that he's been in prison. And it's mm -hmm. almost like, it's really sad that some of them were like only a couple of years ago, you know, more recent memory, like, Oh yeah, your uncle passed away, you know, three years ago. It's like just so close to have been able to, you know, see them and spend time with them yeah. when he was in jail. And again, you know, from Marvin's perspective, it's like, okay, how do I respond to that? Yeah. You know, it's like, okay. You know, it's just like there's a part of him that's coming out of this numbness, you know, that's like, I don't know how to address that, you know, and we see him kind of let loose a little bit when he's hanging out with Wade in the in the trailer. They're playing some old music and there's another great scene. It's like, hey, you have any more of those CDs? And he's like, CDs, <laughs> man, come on. MP3, you know, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but I think like again another reason why i like the way this is written is because the other way that this movie subverts expectations and stereotypes is that eventually marvin winds up hanging out a lot more with delta ashley franciosi's character and man that could have developed into like be cute a romance whatever a quickie whatever but i i love how they're both trying to figure out their space mm -hmm. and trying to figure out like okay how am i supposed to be around this person and especially delta because you know and ashley does a great job at navigating this character's you know inner place you know just she's somebody who grew up knowing what had happened to a family member and knowing that marvin this guy marvin you know did this thing but again she's too young to really she was such a young child when this happened 17 years ago because she's in her 20s now and um well yeah because i think this i think the incident because i was trying to figure out the timeline because they mentioned you know the the incident happened 20 years ago but he was in jail for 17 years so i think right. the incident happened 20 years ago and there was probably a, like a long trial Right. Uh, and then he got, you know, sentenced and, and went away. So she would have been, yeah. you know, an infant. But yeah, to your point, much. it's it's a, a kind of a cool and, and tragic dimension to this story. She had to learn that Marvin was, in fact, is, in fact, a human being, because all she knows is probably Russell, you know, and yeah. his anger building this guy up as a, a monster who just went out like killing old people. And, right. you know, you can understand why she was nervous to say that she had even spoken to him in anything other than, you know, an F you. Right. Yeah. And so, you know, gradually they come to just, you know, see each other as, you know, real people. And, you know, he's also kind of curious and again, 
uh, observant uh, when when he's noticing her at her job at the hospital. Um, you know, I, he's not. You know, he he's not the sharpest knife in the drawer, but he's no dummy. Yeah. You know, um, and so he picks up on. You know, he's kind of street smart. He picks up on people and their behavior. Um, and I think in that sense, he he kind of, uh, based on the way people can judge him, based on the way he looks, he's all tatted and he's got this kind of like a red kind of swipe back mohawk type look. Um, and people could easily judge him as like, oh, he's just some strung out junkie, you know. But, you know, when you give him a chance like this movie does, you know, you, you see him as a, 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 you know, fully developed person and he has emotions and feelings and thoughts and fears. And, and um, I think that his time with Delta gradually brings it out. We even see a different dimension to her, you know, uh, inevitably um, that, you know, she's, I guess, teaching this, a class of seniors some type of like a exercise aerobics in like probably like a you know gymnasium somewhere and it's just like oh well this is fun I mean she's doing this you know for her community and everything and you know and, and he joins in and again that could have been like a cheesy montage but it wasn't you know um, I thought it was a way back into a, a slow way back into society for him and also the fact that getting back to that church scene Delta, I think she had to work or she had to go pick up her kid or something. She was very deliberately left. She was like the one person in the town who was not in that church. She was meeting there for brunch, right? Right. Well, they, yeah, they're going to they're yeah. going to meet for brunch. Right. Exactly. Um, so I think if she had been there, because I recognized a couple of the the at least one of the people from that senior group was in the church that day. That's right. Yeah. And I think if she had been with not even necessarily with Bernadette and Marvin, but just been in the church at that time, mm -hmm. she could have possibly easily diffused that situation because she's like, look, we were just doing a trust fall with this guy last week, you know, and, and I vouch for him. What am I going to kick me out too? I would have loved to have talked more with uh, Franca about that whole trust fall scene. Cause I thought that that was really poignant and obviously deliberate to put in there mm -hmm. um and it you know it's more of just this class or this group that you know um delta is is leading it seems like it's it's more than just like say oh working out with seniors you know um it is more of like um a, a mental health thing than a physical health thing so th that whole idea of it's not just a trust fall thing but there's this moment where there's a character in the middle of the circle and they are, they have their eyes closed and their arms folded and everybody else in a circle is just kind of passing, passing them around. around. Yeah. And I thought that that was really like, it, I thought that was really powerful because it's just like this sensation and feeling of being touched by all these different people and they are controlling your movement and you are just this kind of vessel. I thought that that was really powerful because it is all about kind of like the trust fall. It's all about just letting go and, and, and embracing that vulnerability. Um, so I, I, you know, I, I wondered as I was watching this movie, like she wrote this movie too, which was crazy to me um, because, you know, I, I was wondering, I'm like, well, how did she come up with, there's obviously, themes in this movie but how did she, did she read something about somebody like this or did she you know how did she come up with these these characters and this uh this situation but you know even incorporating that whole you know uh trust fall and, and handing you know relying on other people this exercise that's that's more of like a maybe maybe that's more of like an acting exercise that she wants to experience because that's something you would do like maybe in an acting workshop too yeah. And, you know, I, she is so smart with the character relationships that I feel like there's almost like an MCU map uh, somewhere just for this movie that she had drawn out because one of the early scenes, I was kind of scratching my head. And then by the end, it sort of made sense when we see Delta going to this underpass 
to deal to to deal mm-hmm. drugs that she boosted from the hospital she weighed as her customer and we see these kind of figures lurking in the background we don't know who any of these people are because this is the first like 10 minutes 15 minutes of the movie so like is she gonna get jumped you know right. she seems to know this guy maybe she's dealt to him before but he's, he's so shifty that you're like okay where's the switchblade but then by the end of the film realize that you know, Wade knows, probably knows who she is, definitely knows who her brother is. So Mm -hmm. there's probably some kind of a code like, yeah, it's great. She's selling us drugs, but no one's going to do anything to her. (laughs) She's right. She doesn't have plot armor. She's got Russell armor on. Right. And it's just a detail that like you could very easily miss it or go the direction of, well, she does get jumped and that leads to its own other cliche problems. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I really appreciate, um, Again, I know I'm repeating myself, but I really appreciate how the how characters are portrayed here. It, I was kind of reminded a little bit, uh, this movie is a little bit more comedic, but I was kind of reminded a little bit of like Peanut Butter Falcon. Um, I saw, I haven't watched that oh, yet. That was, that was from last yeah. year, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I got to check that out. Uh, but, um, you know, where it's just, you know, people that you would norm- normally not see on screen necessarily. Um, and... Uh, or at least in this way without, you know, the typical stereotypes. And, um, but man, I, it's kind of crazy that like this year we have directorial debuts from uh, great actresses like Rebecca Hall, Maggie Gyllenhaal, and Franca Patenta, um, all putting out great movies. And um, this, this definitely will be, you know, on my year end list. Um, I don't know how it would be received. I don't really care. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I, I I care that people see it. I yeah. want people to see it. But as far as I get the feeling that I could I could sense some maybe critic eye rolls at this, but I I never I don't never really understand that. Well, it's uh, not going to be coming for me. So yeah, we're, yeah. we're definitely on the same page on this one. Um, but yeah, I think. I hopefully we've <laughs> sold this <laughs> movie to people. We don't have any vested interest in uh, the film outside of just wanting people to, to see something that I think we both really care about. So uh, I appreciate you talking, talking home with me. Hopefully um, we have a home run here. I, yes. Uh, <laughs> I don't have another home uh, pun to, to work into that because I'm tired, but yeah, congratulations on, on getting the last word that's not the last word i'm gonna wrap it up but uh no david Fowley of keeping it real (laughs) thank you very much and uh yeah we'll talk again soon about something for those uh, out there who are watching this or listening please uh like and subscribe check david out at keeping it real uh links in the description down below and uh yeah onward and upward through the slodge of a uh, slog of award season and i do have to ask you david yes your version of the round table how are you putting that out are you going to transcribe uh, are you doing video i was just going to say we, we you probably will be seeing our our round tables at some point i'm probably gonna either put it at the end of my review of this movie you know um or have it on its own i haven't decided yet but it, it i will will include it because i think it's it's it was special to me and i think it's some great stuff Cool. Well, I will definitely I'll link to it in the descriptions for this show. Cool. And I'm going to put I'm putting the my round table out as a separate kind of thing. So people can check that out there. Plugs, plugs, Great. plugs. But uh, yeah, definitely check it out. And uh, yeah, thanks. And we'll catch you later. All right. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>